Hi, and welcome to VMware Code. I'm Cody McCain, and today I have with me Antonin Bass. We are both uh, contributors, and uh, Antonin is a maintainer of Project Antria and a staff engineer at VMware. I'm a project, um, um, I'm a product manager at VMware as well. And today we have a really exciting uh, set of tasks that we've put together to both introduce uh, Project Antria and actually show you how to uh, jump in and become a contributor and actually um, put together a feature. And we're going to do that live for you today. So to get started, what we're going to do today is, is, is take you on our developer journey and introduce you to uh, first, what, what is Project Antria? And, and Project Antria is a container networking interface. And so we're going to be talking a lot about Kubernetes today. Uh, modern application networking within a Kubernetes cluster. And so we'll, we'll spend uh, a little bit of time here at the beginning, you know, telling, telling you a little bit more about what Project Antria is and, and how it helps us to connect containers to the network when using Kubernetes. Uh, in the second part, we'll actually talk about how Antria uses Prometheus. And we use Prometheus for um, surfacing all of the operating metrics um, that give us information about the load and health um, of Antria, as, as well as um, you know what's happening in terms of current network flows. And then finally, what we're going to do is actually take you through a real life scenario where you know I've 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 come to uh, want to, want to use an open source project, right? And and we've all been in this situation where we've got a we've got a project in, and we want to uh, use it, but it doesn't have that one feature that we really need. Um, and that's the beauty about open source is that anybody can download the code, uh, pull down the, the, the assets from the repository, and suggest a change and actually code and implement that change. And so that's what we're going to do today for you live is we're actually going to add a new feature to Antria, take you through that process. And once we've kind of done all those three things, what we hope that you'll see is, uh, number one, um, you know, the uh, value that Antria can bring to your Kubernetes uh, project. Uh, and two, to show you how easy it is to jump in and get involved uh, with an open source project uh, like, like Antria. So in this uh, presentation today, we're going to be using a couple of uh, developer tools that you'll, you'll want to um, have available. Uh, we're going to be using Git and uh, Vagrant, which is going to help us set up some virtual machines. Um, Project Entry is coded in Golang. You don't actually need Golang to build it as we build in containers, but you know you may want to do some additional testing and, and have the Golang tools available for your IDE, for example. Uh, we'll also uh, be using Docker to create uh, containers, and we'll be using Ansible um, um, as part of the uh, prescripted uh, setup scripts that we use to, to provision a cluster for our testing. So, what I'm going to do first is hand it over uh, to Antonin. Uh, he's going to uh, take us through actually deploying uh, a, a cluster that we're going to use today for our development and, and, and our testing. And what I'm, he's going to take you through uh, setting that up. Basically, it's going to be a couple of steps. I'm going to show you what those steps are. I'm going to turn it over to him. He's actually going to walk you through it. We're going to uh, start the provisioning process. And once that gets started, uh, while that's happening in the background, I'm going to introduce you to some of the fundamentals behind Antria. So the first thing is, is that uh, we're going to clone the repository um, from the VMware Tanzu uh, GitHub repository, and it's just Antria. Um, once we've cloned it, we actually have a make file set up uh, in that uh, project directory, and you just run make build, and that'll actually build uh, Project Antria. And this should work on Mac, Linux, um, and Windows. Uh, the next thing that we do is we're going to deploy a cluster. And so in deploying Antria, we actually have a lot of really useful test scripts set up in our test directory um, under the end-to-end -end testing and infra uh, subdirectories. Um, there we have a, a vagrant directory that has a, a script file called provision. And provision literally uh, just calls out to vagrant. Vagrant's going to create our virtual machines, make sure that they've got the uh, right images, um, and then um, after those virtual machines come up um, and Kubernetes is running, uh, we'll use another script called push Antria that actually takes the Antria uh, images that were built in, in the previous step and um, 
copies those over to the image or to the virtual machines and then loads them into Kubernetes using kubectl. So without further ado, and before we get into this, I'm going to pass it over uh, to Antonin so he can actually start the uh, provisioning process. Uh, thank you, Cody. So basically what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run the steps that Cody showed to you uh, on the slide. Uh, so hopefully my, my terminal font is large enough here. Let me just uh, increase it a bit. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to create a directory for this session here. There we go. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to clone the Entria repo. So let me switch over to uh, the GitHub web page for Entria. I click on code, uh, copy the SSH uh, uh, URL here, go back to my terminal, and I'm going to do git clone and clone the repo, which should be pretty fast because the repo is not uh, too large. We'll try to keep it uh, small. So I'm going to cd into Entria, and I'm going to run the make command that uh, Cody showed on the slides. So what this is going to do is, this is going to pull like uh, some base images uh, we use for Entria, which uh, include our dependency. We're going to pull in our uh, Go dependencies, and then we're going to use a Golang compiler to build the Entria code. Uh, and all of this is going to happen inside the, the Docker. And at the end, we're going to produce a single Docker image for Entria, which includes all the binaries and all the bits and pieces you need to deploy Entria in a cluster. While this is going on, uh, in the second terminal, also let me increase the font, here we go. Uh, I'm going to cd into that same directory. And I'm going to provision the cluster using the provision.sh script uh, that uh, Cody mentioned. Now, if I go to the Entria repo and I go to test E2E here, we give some detailed steps on how you can um, uh, provision the Kubernetes cluster and uh, run the Kubernetes components in that cluster uh, using um, uh, Ansible playbook and uh, creating the VMs using Vagrant. So I'm just going to be using that script here uh, to provision uh, the cluster. Let me just uh, make sure that uh, it gets started correctly. OK, so it's going to bring up two virtual machines, and it's going to install all the dependencies for Kubernetes on them. And then it's going to start running the Kubernetes demons. All right, and I think my build is still ongoing here. We're at the uh, stage where we run the Go compiler. OK, so while this is going on, it's going to take a couple of minutes. I'm going to hand it over back to uh, Cody so we can give a quick intro to uh, Project Entria. Great. Thanks, Antonin. So I will reshare my screen. If you could stop sharing yours for one second. OK, I'm still sharing. I lost my I lost my zoom window which is not great so while he's tracking that down let me tell you a little bit about project Antria so it was started a little um, uh, less than a year ago um, we actually uh, announced it um, at uh, last year's uh, KubeCon um, that would have been in, in, in 2019 at the end of the year. And Project Antria is um, an open source uh, CNI, which is a container network interface, network plugin, providing pod connectivity and network policy enforcement with open vSwitch and Kubernetes. So the key thing to take away from, from that definition is, you know, we are, we are a plugin for Kubernetes that, that actually takes care of all the plumbing necessary to uh, enable network connectivity for pods. Um, in addition to that, we also can enforce upstream network policy as well as have our own uh, enhancements for, for additional native policy features. And all of this is built on top of Open vSwitch, which is a very stable, um, a very stable uh, software-defined networking component within the within the Linux uh, kernel. 
Now, Project Antria, you know, again, it's very young, but it's already has 683 stars on GitHub, 116 forks, and and we've got a uh, you know multiple parties that have jumped in and started contributing to it, and so we're really excited that um, you know for being so young, we've already got a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of excitement around you know the feature sets that we're adding and and, and the aggressiveness of our of our uh, roadmap, and so you know. We encourage you to go take a look at what's happening at the end of this presentation because I'm certain that there are some things that uh, you um, as developers can help us to even go faster with. One of the things that we wanted to focus on in building uh, this project is we wanted to make sure that container networking was easy, right? It's uh, you know, networking in general can sometimes be difficult um, if, if it's not something that you uh, deal with all the time. So we wanted to make sure that we had you know, a lot of usability tweaks and diagnostic uh, tooling uh, within the uh, project so that you could quickly diagnose and, and, and surface um, any problems that you might have in setting up networking uh, in Kubernetes. Um, we also wanted to make sure that it ran anywhere. Kubernetes runs in a lot of different places now, right? You can, you can run uh, Kubernetes on-premise, you can run it on top of um, you know, vSphere, or, um, you can run it on, um, on a public cloud, um, you know, either do it yourself or, or use a distribution, or you can run it inside of um, you know, something like uh, um, AKS or uh, GKE or EKS, which are all, you know, managed Kubernetes offerings from a lot of the different public clouds. And so wherever you run it, uh, we wanted to make sure that Antria uh, could provide uh, policy enforcement capability and, it's, and in some cases the connectivity pieces as well um, to make it easy to do networking in Kubernetes wherever you're at. So let's take a little uh, dive into what we actually mean by Kubernetes cluster networking. It, when, when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, the nice thing about uh, the way that Kubernetes handles workload scheduling um, and, and, and the way that it exposes it to the network is every single workload or pod uh, gets its own IP address, which makes it a lot easier uh, to deal with. So I don't have to do you know, crazy things like map and managing port numbers like I used to do in, in, in the Docker days, if, if you will. Um, but what that means is, is that Kubernetes uh, plugins that provide networking support have to implement, you know, basically three different types of uh, uh, packet transport patterns. Uh, they have to be able to allow pods to communicate directly with other pods. They have to allow pods to communicate with a service. Um, within Kubernetes, there is a service abstraction, which basically allows you to signify a set of pods as providing some service. And so it's, it's, a, it's a form of load balancing that happens at layer four. And so uh, we have to have some way to in, either interact with the native uh, load balancing function called kubeproxy, um, or we have to implement that ourselves. And so Entria actually can do both. Um, and then finally, um, it has to be able to take traffic from the outside world and map that onto uh, or, or route that to a service. If you look at where it falls in terms of the networking stack, right at the very bottom of the stack is where we typically have the underlying fabric. This is the network that all the hosts that are part of a Kubernetes cluster are connected to. At the top of the stack, where you see ingress and service mesh, that's where we are, are dealing with things like um, load balancing at the edge of the cluster, so like L7 proxies, and, and, and service mesh and uh, is dealing with uh, proxying traffic between applications in the cluster. So if you look at it, ingress kind of handles the north-south direction where service mesh handles east-west. And in the very middle, we've got um, cluster DNS, which basically does what you would think it does. It's name resolution for DNS. But the things that we're focused on today are the CNI network plugin and the service load balancer, which we've already defined what some of the responsibilities for that are. One final thing, we've talked about where we can run Antria, but not only can we run it anywhere Kubernetes runs, we can also uh, easily support Linux and Windows. Since we're built on OVS, it provides a very common abstraction for us for running Kubernetes. Um, for, for Antria, we program against OVS, um, which as uh, OVS advances and, and adds new features and, and, and we add new features to Antria, we don't have to have two separate implementations and two separate networking stacks that we're dealing with um, across the operating systems, which is a, a huge advantage. So to talk a little bit about OVS, um, you know, OVS is, um, again, a, a very stable 
um, piece of the Linux kernel at this point that provides you know software defined networks. And we chose OVS is because we really wanted a high performance you know uh, programmable switch that that is going to allow us to be aggressive with the way that we add features to the CNI. Um, and we have a you know a really solid uh, set of uh, stable networking primitives by which we can build and compose those functions. Um, we've talked about it being portable, but not only is it portable and programmable, um, it also supports a lot of advanced features uh, like uh, DBTK, you know, AFXDP. Um, additionally, we can um, use things like SRIOV and do um, you know offload um, of of a lot of the OVS data path onto you know smart NICs as well. So you know, OVS is a really advanced um, core uh, data plane and uh, data plane component that we use within Antria. So looking at the architecture um, of Antria, Antria was built with Kubernetes in mind. Um, it has a very Kubernetes-centric view of the world. Um, and so it uses, for example, Kubernetes for the storage of uh, a lot of its configuration objects and state. So we use things like CRDs. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we're able to plug directly into, um, as, a, as a Kubernetes controller, into the Kubernetes lifecycle and, and actually see events like pods being added, network policies being added, et cetera. And the way that um, Antria works is there's an agent deployed onto every um, host and that agent interacts with OVS in the kernel and is able to take commands from, or to, or, or to take um, um, configuration from the central Antria controller, um, whether it is to do with, you know, what, what network policies should be set up for, for edge firewalls on the, on the applications, um, or, you know, what IP addresses to um, assign, et cetera. You know, all of that takes place um, from that Antria agent um, programming the OVS data plane on each host. And, you know, this, this distribution then is also very efficient as well. For example, we're able to centrally calculate all the reachability that is allowed, you know, between the pods based on the network policy that's been applied and, and only give the pieces that are necessary out to each agent so that we can, you know, keep that um, distribution of configuration and, and updates, you know, very efficient. And the final thing I'll touch on here is what we do with our, our policy model. Um, within Antria, um, we have built a, a full set of uh, policy capabilities and, and, and are continually adding to those as well uh, that allow policy delegation, um, that allow, you know, for example, uh, multiple tenant uh, capabilities within Antria so that we can uh, do things like um, allow developers to build the policies that they need around their application because they're the experts around, you know, ports and protocols, et cetera. And then we allow um, um, cluster uh, administrators, you know, platform operators uh, to build policies where they need to either protect shared services or, or maybe have some more global policies uh, that they care about uh, to protect the applications as a whole across the cluster or to protect, you know, tenants from each other. And, we're not going to focus a lot on the policy today. We're going to be looking actually at a lot of the uh, pieces around observability. And what I have on this diagram here um, is showing the different ways that you can interact um, with the Entria control plane. And, you know, one of those pieces is Prometheus uh, providing observability functions, right? So we, we expose a lot of the metrics and the operational data that's happening in the data plane um, into uh, Prometheus and, what Antonin is going to do today is, is to show us, you know, um, how do we how do we extend that and, and how can we, uh, you know, make use of that. Uh, additionally, we have things like Ant Cuddle and Octant UI um, that provide additional visualizations for things like trace flows um, and you know other diagnostic information about the health of uh, of the Antria control plane. So by now, Antonin, I would I would assume that we've had enough time for. The provisioning to be completed and we have our kubernetes cluster stood up and and ready to go so i'm going to hand it back to you uh to explain a little bit about what we're doing um around prometheus
Yes, thanks, Koli. I started sharing my screen again. So yeah, you're correct. We had enough time to uh, well build in trio that only took like a couple of minutes. And uh, thanks to Docker caching, it, it only gets faster uh, for the second time you need to do a build. Um, we also had enough time to uh, provision our two uh, Vagrant uh, VM nodes, which we're going to use to build like a Kubernetes cluster. So that took a little bit longer. That took about like seven minutes. But that's something you only need to do uh, once or quite infrequently when you when you developed for uh, Entria. Um, so if I go back to that README guide I, I showed before, uh, it shows how you can set kube config uh, for the cluster that was just created, and that's important because it lets you uh, use kubectl to uh, to inspect your cluster and uh, look up information about it. So let me set that environment variable here, and so. Uh, once I've set this for, uh, environment variable, I can just use kubectl to look up information about my cluster. OK, and right now it does show my two nodes uh, running the latest version of Kubernetes. But they're both in the not ready state. And they're not in the not ready state because uh, there is actually no uh, network plugging, plugin providing the networking functions for the cluster. So when we created the cluster, we, we told Kubernetes that we're going to use like a CNI plugin, a third party plugin, to provide networking functions in the cluster, but we haven't deployed one yet. And as a result, as a uh, network is not working in the cluster yet. And if we look at the different pods in the cluster, we're going to see that our core DNS pods providing like the DNS services inside the cluster um, are currently pending, they're not running, and that's because uh, they're in the pod network and they rely on that uh, CNI plugin to provide the networking functions and, and connect them to the cluster. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to deploy entry now in our cluster. And uh, going back to that readme again, uh, we, show, we see that uh, there is like a script that you can use to push, uh, to, to load the Docker image we've just built locally uh, using make build uh, in, in the entry repository to push it, to load it into every node along with the entry deployment YAML. And once everything is loaded in the node, um, the script is going to apply the YAML uh, in the cluster, which means that we're going to run entry on every node. We're going to run the different entry components. So let me copy that script here. Um, OK, I'm going to ch cheat a little bit here. Uh, I know that there is like a Prometheus flag you need to pass if you want to uh, enable um, uh, the entry components to export Prometheus metrics. And so I'm going to use that flag right away so we don't have to uh, deploy entry again later. Um, so what that script does is, uh, as I said, yeah, it's going to save the ZC image that we just built locally uh, to a tarball. Then it's going to SCP the, the tar file into each uh, of the two uh, VM nodes. And once this is complete, it's going to apply the entry YAML. So while this is doing that, Anton, and the reason that we, we do this is we want to get the latest image that we built, but uh, somebody running Antria um, in a production environment, they would probably just pull that image from a repository, correctly? Yeah, that's correct. They, they wouldn't even yep. use this script. Uh, they wouldn't use this script because they would just pull the latest Antria that we've released, uh, which is currently 0.8.2. Got yeah, it. So they wouldn't need to build the image uh, themselves. Uh, we we also all the released images on, on Docker Hub. Well, that's perfect because uh, I think we just talked for like 20 seconds. So I think that gave like uh, all the entry uh, uh, components time to be created. And yes, if I look at the pods again, now I see that I have one entry agent running on every node. Let me provide these flags so we get a bit more information. Yeah, so we have one agent running on every node. Uh, we have an entry controller, which is a centralized entity, uh, which is used to distribute uh, network policies to the agents. And now if we look at the coordinate spots, we see that they're in the running state here. So if I do get, get nodes again. Um, so uh, another question, Anson, and on, on, as you're looking at that, um, and so there should be an agent then for every node that's running, correct? That's correct, yeah. Because and we then the controller. Use, uh, we, we oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. And then the controller is, that's what's actually watching, you know, when pods get created and such and then, and basically figuring out what we need to do in terms of plumbing that pod and, and uh, we send that in for, and, and filtering traffic for that pod, we send that out to the agents as that happens. Yeah, the controller is specifically for network policy implementation. We don't 
really use it for anything else right now. The network okay. functionality, the, the CNI functionality itself is uh, handled uh, entirely. It's all in the agent. And that's kind of okay. like something that's different from uh, a, a, an alternative solution like OVN, which is also like OVN Kubernetes is also uh, a, a network plugin uh, that um, that supports uh, Kubernetes. It's also a CNI implementation, but in their case, they, they rely on OVN running and they have like kind of like a, a centralized entity, which is like leverage every time a pod is added to the cluster uh, to provision the networking for it. In entry, as that part is completely distributed and handled locally by, by each, each agent. So it sounds like entry is a lot lighter weight in terms of the way that the controller and the control plane is implemented. Yeah, and that's really because entry is not just like a, it's not like a full SDN solution, right? It's uh, it's uh, it's something that was designed specifically for networking, and so we focus on the Kubernetes networking model, the Kubernetes networking needs, and what we want to support as part of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, in in the case of OVN and OVN Kubernetes, you need to be able you need to run OVN first, and that piece itself has like a lot of complexity and northbound, southbound APIs. And so with OVM Kubernetes, you just like integrate with that. And so every time a pod is created to give like a concrete example, like uh, the, the, the agent part in OVM, because they also have a, an agent part is gonna block until the centralized entity can annotate the pod with uh, the IP address, for example. And then they're gonna configure the networking locally. In, in entry, okay. uh, there is, we don't have that, uh, asynchronous uh, piece we can end all the cni calls from kubelet directly on the on the node makes sense okay so we have our our kubernetes cluster set up what i'd like to do if you give me the screen back for just one second i want to talk a little bit about what prometheus does and then maybe you can actually show us um, how we're using uh, prometheus within antria so to, to get started here we'll take a look at you know we've got our successful uh, creation, right? We've deployed Antria. Um, so now let's take a look at, um, you know, what what is Prometheus? So Prometheus is a way for us to capture real-time data, um, uh, you know, and different statistics about the operation of our of our software. Um, there's there's a component that is actually a library component that we compile in uh, with the Antria code base that you know, as, as things are happening, you know, if, if the different things that we're calculating, um, we write to that library and what ends up happening is the statistics uh, that are captured, they get published to a endpoint. And that endpoint then is scraped by a separate Prometheus server that collects all that information. And, and again, for, in our case, uh, we're actually publishing that information on our um, agents um, as an endpoint. So that means that every node that's running an agent is going to have its set of statistics that are getting published. And we have a single Prometheus server going around and collecting um, all of that information. And when it collects it, depending on the type of statistic and what, and what we're looking at, right, it can, it can store that information into a time series database that, they, that can then be visualized in a tool like Grafana so that we can, you know, draw really nice uh, charts and graphs or, you know, look at, you um, uh, various gauges over over time and and see how things are, are are changing within the cluster. So that gives you just a really basic understanding of what Prometheus does. Prometheus is is, is far more has far more features than what we're going to get into today in terms of the way that you can actually um, uh, describe uh, the types of data that you want to capture, how you want to query that data. Um, you know, there's a whole advanced uh, uh, query language for how I read that data and and mix and match that data. Uh, that, that gets presented. But um, for now, just understand that, you know, the data is created in the entry component, it's collected by the Prometheus server, and then we're going to visualize it in Grafana. So I'm going to hand it back to you now that we've kind of walked through that, Antonin. Let's just, let's see how uh, Antrigo is using uh, Prometheus today. All right, there we go. So this is where we left off. Uh, uh, and so uh, as Cody said, we're gonna now log into the uh, Prometheus server uh, and take a quick look at the metrics which are available. And then we're gonna move on to graph and a visualization. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the services in my cluster. And remember when we pushed Entria with uh, this command here, we passed the dash dash Prometheus flag. And so when we provide this flag, uh, we're automatically automatically going to deploy uh, a Prometheus server as a Kubernetes deployment in the monitoring namespace. And we're going to create a node port service for Prometheus that we can use to connect to the Prometheus server UI. And so we can find this node port service here. 
and it's telling us that it's running on port 30,000 on every node. It's an odd port service, so I can use uh, each node's public IP to, to connect to the service. And that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, let's look at one node's IP. This is, this is a node IP here. Uh, let's take it and port 30,000. There we go. So this is a, like a very simple UI, which is why we're going to uh, take a look at the graph now UI after. But what we can do is we can see here in the drop down menus the different metrics we export for both the entry agent and uh, the attract controller. And one of them, for example, is local pod count. So we can take a look at this metric here. Uh, and uh, here we have it in like just plain uh, a numerical format. We can also like access a graph to see how it uh, changes over time. But basically the state we're in right now, let me go back to that, is that it's telling us that on this node, uh, the node with the IP address that ends with dot 100, uh, we have two pods running. And those are actually the two core DNS pods uh, providing DNS functions in, in the cluster that I mentioned earlier. And uh, on, on the other node, uh, 101, we have like a single pod uh, running. And if I go back to my, um, uh, to my terminal here, uh, we can see that this is actually the, uh, the Prometheus server pod. So kind of like all three pods are accounted for. All the other pods are actually uh, running in the host network. So entry A is not responsible for uh, providing like uh, uh, networking functionality for those. They're actually in the same network namespace as, as the node, not part of the cluster network per se. All right, so now that I've uh, shown the Prometheus UI, we can go to Grafana here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a dashboard and add a query for uh, that metrics we just looked at. So I already connected Grafana to uh, our Prometheus server. Uh, I already added it as a, I added Prometheus as a, as a data source for uh, Grafana. So we don't have to go through this again, but it's as easy as just providing the uh, IP address for one of the nodes and, um, and the port number. Now let's go to the available metrics. You see that they are aggregated and that we have a section for entry here. And let's look at the one we've been looking at, which is entry agent local pod count. Here we go. Uh, so let me reduce this. Last 15 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it started at, at that time, which is when I uh, deployed entry with Prometheus in the cluster. And since then, we haven't had like any changes because we haven't been like creating or deleting pods. So that number has stayed at uh, two for one node and one for the uh, other node. Uh, so yeah, so that's one metrics we have. Uh, you, you have the full list here. Uh, I think we also publish it in our uh, Prometheus documentation for Entria. Another metrics we would look at is the OBS uh, uh, flow count. But basically, uh, you have an idea of what uh, Entria metrics look like when visualized in, uh, in, in Grafana. It makes a lot of sense, Anton. And so, so I'm curious, right? Um, I've I've downloaded Entry, I've installed it on my cluster, right? I'm I'm monitoring, but we we're we're noticing that uh, ever so often uh, we're getting intermittent connectivity uh, to the applications on our cluster, and and we notice that it happens when when the number of connections increases really quickly um, to our cluster, and and so. You know, we were we were looking through that list of, of metrics that you had on entry and noticed there's really nothing there that's talking about how we're handling connection tracking. We think that maybe you know this issue might be related to connection tracking. So would it be easy to add um, a statistic um, that would tell us a little more information about how entry is handling connection tracking? Um, yeah, I think definitely. And it's actually a, a good idea. I think the, the problem you mentioned is kind of like a, a well-known problem in that container networking space. Uh, uh, and that's because by default, uh, the connection tracking table on Linux has like a, a fixed size, uh, which is going to depend on the distribution and, and your kernel and everything. But it's usually around like a, a 250K, for example, 500K and something like this. And uh, because on Linux, you also have this... Um, a TCP connection state, right, called time wait, uh, which uh, is a time window during which, like, uh, the socket is not going to be reusable for new connections. Uh, 
uh, for new connections within like a time window of by default 120 seconds. It's very easy. And, and during that time window, the connections are going to stay in the connection tracking table. It's actually very easy to just like run out of entries in your uh, in, in your uh, connection table. And at, at this point, when you try to commit a new connection to the connection tra uh, tracking table, your your packets are just going to be dropped, and you're not going to be able to uh, uh, establish that connection with entry. Yeah. And oh, so, that's fantastic. And so, yeah, so, it's definitely possible in Entria to um, you know, to add a new metric that uh, that would like count how many connections we're currently tracking the connection uh, table, so that you on your side as a cluster operator can can take a, uh, can take action. Fantastic. So let's actually let's walk through the process of of how I might um, actually make that happen. If if you don't mind, I'll I'll share my screen again, and. What we'd like to see here is, um, you know, if if I had this problem in in, in the real world, what would I do to um, affect the change in this upstream project? And so, what I'm going to do first is, um, I know that I want to do this enhancement request, so I probably need to go over to the, um, I probably need to go over to the project, and actually, uh, um, oops, sorry, my screen switched on me. Let's try this again. <laughs> I need to go over to the project, and what we're going to do is actually create a uh, a new issue, right? In in GitHub, that's how we actually track issues for um, our project. And actually, we take in uh, you know new issues into the into the project if we want to make enhancements. So I click new issue, and I am going to click on a. I guess this is a feature request, right? Since we're adding something new. So, and the nice thing about what we've set up from our, from our template, you know, perspective is it is it's going to tell us, you know, what are our problems that we're having, and and how do we want to go about um, um, fixing those. So, um, this is going to bounce on me right quick because I've already prepared some some ideas on maybe what I would want to put as as this problem. So let me just cut and paste those in there. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to describe this problem as, oops, here we go. Well, it didn't like the cut and paste, so how about we just type it? <laughs> Sorry about that. The fun of live demos, you never know what you're going to get. You're going to showcase your uh, typing skills. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna paste. So that's okay. So basically, I'm gonna describe my problem here. Actually, before I do it this way, I'll just do a new issue, so I don't have to type all those out again. Feature request. All right, we'll start here. So basically, we are you know my my team is seeing uh, a ceiling on the number of connections allowed for certain workloads. Right. So as we as we add additional volume, you know, connections are dropped after a simultaneous um, connection threshold is reached. And what we think um, we think it may be due to connection tracking table saturation. So what do we want to happen? Well, I, I think it would be useful to have a new metric uh, showing the current number um, of connections in the connection um, tracking table. And we think that um, anything else we want to add, let me think here. This metric would probably be useful for uh, configuring. Um, oops, would be useful for configuring uh, connection tracking table sizes to avoid any type of um, problems in the future, and it would also help us help generate alerts, right? If we if we're gonna if we're getting close to having a problem. So that hopefully we can come in and either, you know, have an automated response to this or or we can have one of our um, engineers take a look at it. 
So I'm going to put all of these things in. I'm going to give it a title. Um, this is basically a, uh, I'm going to call this connection tracking metrics. And I'm going to submit this issue. So Antonin, now that I've submitted this issue, how would we go about actually picking this up and, and adding it to, to the um, existing entry of code base? So I'm going to hand it back over to you. Yep. Good thing I wasn't the one typing that. I typed with two fingers, so that would have taken a while. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been a it wouldn't have been a real demo if something didn't break. So I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, I'm going to refresh that page. And okay, I, I'm going to see. I, I'm just seeing that issue you just opened. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it to myself before someone else from the team uh, claims it. Uh, and that would be kind of like awkward if somebody pushed a, a PR and a fix before I have the opportunity to do that in that in that presentation. So I'm going to assign it to myself, um, and uh, then I'm going to I'm going to start working on it. So we have like documentation in the um, uh, in the entry project about uh, all, all, all the different like uh, workflows. Uh, I mean the, the, the expected workflow as a as a contributor, but it's all like pretty standard. Um, so let me go back to my uh, terminal, uh, and I'm currently in the in the master branch of the repo that I, I just cloned at the beginning of the session. So I'm going to create uh, a development branch, which I'm going to use to uh, add this feature. Uh, and let's look at the name of the issue again: connection tracking metrics. I'm going to call it add connection tracking metrics here. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna be working on that branch, then I'm gonna push that branch to my fork, and I'm up. I'm gonna open a pull request against uh, upstream Entria for uh, the other contributors to Entria to review. Um, and let let's say that I'm not very familiar with a with a code base, but I want to take care of this issue because honestly, that's an issue that would be like I think pretty good for uh, someone who's interested in uh, making a contribution to Entria for the first time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look where in the entry of code base we currently register metrics. So, sorry, I'm, I'm still in the in the directory. Okay, let me do grab. Okay, and I can see. Okay, that's a that's a bunch of stuff. But I can I can look here and I see that for the agent we have that metrics package here and that Prometheus.go file, and we seem to be registering like a bunch of uh, metrics and one of them is like pod count, which is a metrics we looked at in Grafana before. So let me open that file and uh, and see what's going on here. Okay, awesome. So I see that there is a pod count metric here, and uh, it, it's using like a, a gauge, a Prometheus gauge, uh, to to define these metrics. And the gauge is different from a counter. A counter can only be uh, uh, incremented mono monotonically, whereas a, a gauge can go up and down, which is what we expect for the number of local pods and what we would expect for the number of connections as well. So let me just copy this, scroll down to the end here, and I'm going to define my new metrics. Let's call it connection count. Count uh, Adrian entry agent connection count is going to be the, the name that we export to Prometheus and the number of connections on local mode, which I'll manage. Let's, let's keep that description for now. We're going to put it in like alpha stability level because that's something we're still working on. Uh, we don't know if uh, everything about that uh, metric is going to be stable in the future or if we, we may change the definition. All right. Let's see if the pod count metrics shows up anywhere else in this file. Okay, I see that we are we're registering it. So we probably need to do the same thing for our metric. Uh, where can I put it? I'm gonna put it here. Initialize Prometheus metrics directly. Let's see. Okay, uh, pod count, it's connection count. Uh, and if there is an error, We're going to produce one error log message. OK, so what we've done so far is we've defined our metrics and we've registered it. So now, if I were to like build entry and deploy it again, I would show it. I, I would probably see it in my uh, Prometheus server UI or in my uh, Grafana 
uh, uh, dashboard. And uh, Cody, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. And um, but basically, I, I need to set that metrics, right? I need to increment it and decrement it when I, when I need to. And so that's where it gets a, a, a bit tricky. But I, I happen to know that in the agent code for Entria, we have some logic where we pull connections. And we do that because we, we are actually currently working on a feature to export IPFIX records about each connection for each agent in the network so that that data can be uh, aggregated and, and visualized as like uh, ni nice diagrams in the UI. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage that code, which is already like polling connections. And I'm going to see if I can use that code to, um, uh, to um, sorry. Uh, I'm still sharing my screen, right, Cody? You can yes, see yes. Uh, well, while you're switching over to that, to that code to actually add the logic for, um, you know, recording the connections what i what i wanted to just you know summarize mm -hmm. here is that with prometheus there's basically two steps right you have to create the metric and register it right and that doesn't actually is the metric isn't doing anything yet it's just basically telling prometheus to put a placeholder on the scrape endpoint uh, for that metric and now um, as he switches over to the other file um, he's actually going to go about populating that metric with data yeah exactly and so this is a file I was talking about, which is uh, doing like a polling on all the connections. Let me go to the bottom here. Yeah. So what we do here is we're looking at all the connections we have, which are uh, committed by Entria. And uh, uh, we put this, put it in this map or array, uh, whichever data structure it is. But you can see that if we look at the length of this data structure, what we get is the actual number of connections uh, committed by, by Entria. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to grab that number. Wait. And here, I'm going to use it to uh, increment my metrics. So the way I do that is I'll just quickly open the file we had before. Here we go. We need to import that file so we can access that new uh, connection count variable, which we've defined and which stores our uh, metrics object. So let me import it here. I'm just going to grab it. It's package agent metrics. We import the package. There we go. And now that I have it, I can access it. So the name is connection count in the metrics package. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, set. So I think that type of metrics gauge can support like increment, decrement operations. And in this case, we just want to set uh, set the value because uh, we that that the value we have right now. We we're not using like uh, uh, like incremental variations. We every time we pull, we get the full list of connections, and so uh, the exact number of connections. And uh, if I've had in the metrics before like this, and I remember that set takes like a, a float value. And so we're going to cast our num connections variable to a float and set it. Here we go. Uh, and that was actually pretty short and pretty quick because we already have that full list of connections. So that, that value was uh, already accessible like very easily once you know where to look. OK, so now that we have this, uh, we should be able to rebuild Entria. So I'm going to run make again. And hopefully this is like pretty fast because, I mean, if you remember the output from last time, this step took a while because we had to uh, download all the libraries, all the Go module dependencies for Entria. We don't have to do that again, thanks to uh, Docker cache, but we still have to run the uh, Golang compiler uh, to uh, produce the Entria binaries. Now, when I build the new image, um, Anton, I, I don't have to recreate my cluster every time if I'm developing, right? All I, all I need to do is, is push the new image. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I'm not going to run that provision script again, uh, but I'm going to need to run the push.sh uh, script again, if you remember that one, uh, because now I have a new uh, Docker image locally. So I need once again to load it into every node and uh, basically reapply my, uh, my app. And I would imagine that, you know, in this type of uh, edit, you know, typically we would go in and, and write some unit tests. Obviously, we're constrained on time 
uh, with this presentation. Um, but tell us a little bit about unit tests while we're, while we're waiting for this to compile. Yeah, uh, good point. So we use a uh, Go testing framework for our unit test and our integration test. So in this case, I would say you would probably need like integration tests because you would actually want to test this by creating some connections uh, in Linux in the connection tracking table and, uh, and looking at this there. Or you, you, we could also have some unit tests because if I remember correctly, we have defined some like interfaces for um, uh, for accessing uh, the, the connection table on different uh, operating systems, whether it's like uh, Linux or Windows. And so using that interface that, that we mock in, in Golang, um, uh, we would be able to generate some like uh, fake connections and basically uh, make sure that the whole point of the test would be to make sure that the, the metrics is updated correctly when we hold new connections. Makes sense. Well, it looks like we have a new image ready. Yes, exactly. We do have a new image uh, ready. Now, if you remember, uh, we used that script previously to push the new image to, to, the, to the cluster. Uh, here, and I'm, I'm going to be cheating again, uh, cheating a bit. That's something that would be uh, difficult for, uh, for a new contributor, but that's why we're always happy to provide help for uh, people interested in contributing features to, to Entria. Uh, what I need to do is I'm going to need to edit this script because this new metric I've, I've added is actually relying on that connection polling feature that I mentioned before, right? And so right now it's not enabled by default. We still configure, uh, we still consider it in the alpha stage uh, because it's still something we're actively working on. It's not like probably not completely stable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly update this script, which should only take like two minutes uh, to add uh, to be able to enable the connection polling, which depends on a feature called uh, flow exporter in entry. It's going to be disabled by default. Basically, I'm just going to copy what we do uh, for uh, Prometheus. Let's call it flow dash exporter. Uh, if the flag is defined, then we set the flow exporter uh, variable to true. And let's see what we do for Prometheus here. It's going to be a bit simpler for this one because for Prometheus, we actually need to uh, add the Prometheus deployment and Prometheus service uh, to the YAML here. We're just going to need to do a simple uh, substitutions in the... So while you're adding that substitution, I was going to elaborate more on, you know, yep. picking up issues. You know, we have a, uh, an entire curated list of good first issues and you can uh, select that when you're viewing issues um, in in GitHub. Uh, our, sharing if you want to show it, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sure. And while you're compiling that and pushing that, I'll I'll, I'll share this piece here so that um, you can understand, you know, how to get involved. Um, and we, one of the things that we pride ourselves, I think, in this uh, project is uh, we have an incredibly um, um, not only a talented set of, of maintainers, but maintainers that you know really enjoy the personal connection with, with all those that are wanting to jump in and contribute. And they um, are great about being very responsive and jumping in um, on Slack, um, you know, start up a Zoom, you know, whatever it takes to get you, um, you know, to be successful and being able to contribute into Antria. We have a Slack channel on uh, the Kubernetes Slack, um, which we, you know, use for, not only announcing information about the project and, and, and discussing architecture about the project, et cetera, but that's where you can you know, hit up one of our, our maintainers or other contributors um, if you have some questions about how to get started or how to use this particular you know, tool set. Maybe you're new to Kubernetes, maybe you're you know, new to container networking in general. Um, definitely you know, jump in and, 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 and say hello to us on those, on those channels. Do we have it ready uh, deployed and, and maybe we can see if that uh, addition worked? Yeah, so let me. Show my screen again. Okay, let me give it back to you here. All right, so you're just a tiny bit early. Uh, I, I finished updating the script, uh, which was like just pretty straightforward. And now the image was already built. So I'm just like pushing it using the script. If you see here, I invoke the script with that new flow exporter flag I just defined. All right, so I do hope uh, that uh, everything worked. 
think one way we can we can verify really quickly, and that's something that's kind of like useful when you're developing for Entria, so maybe it's worth showing it, is that clusters that we create with Vagrant VMs, we can easily SSH into uh, each of the machine. Uh, so here, I'm going to SSH into the master. Um, and uh, on the master, we have the YAML files that we use to uh, deploy entry. Uh, so let me, let's make sure that flu Explorer, yeah, okay, that was enabled. So my, my changes to the script uh, took effect and modified the entry YAML before applying it. So now we should have, a, uh, we should have enabled flow exporter, which is going to support the uh, connection polling, which is going to enable our metrics to be updated correctly. And Great. so that's what we're going to verify right away by going back to, well, maybe, maybe the Prometheus uh, UI first. So I refresh, let's see. Then, oh, oh I see it. Agent count or connection count. Oh, did I have connection? Yeah. Oh, I'm having clicking issues. Here we go. All right, so we see the connection count. It's at zero for one uh, node and four for the other one. Uh, we're gonna talk about this in a second, but let's just go back to the Grafana UI and maybe quickly change our metrics here. Maybe I need to refresh. Let's refresh. Oh, okay, add query. Let's do that again. Uh, Prometheus is my data source and Tria. Perfect, it's right here. And I'm gonna put it on like five minutes and refresh every five seconds there we go okay so right now we see that we have four connections uh, on one node and zero on the other one and really that's because i'm not running like anything interesting on my cluster <laughs> in that kind of scenario the, the issues that cody described where you would like fill up the connection uh, table would definitely not happen right but what i have is ahead of time for for the purpose of this uh, uh session I prepared, let me see if it's here. I prepared a YAML file, which, oh, I put it in, uh, in, in TMP, so let me copy it. Well, while, you're, while you're loading that, I was going to encourage anyone, um, if you have questions um, about what you've seen today, um, you, can, you can ask them on, on the chat. Um, or, you know, maybe even better, you can go over to our Antria Slack if you haven't signed up for the Kubernetes Slack, um, our, our Antria channel there and ask your questions. Um, so that way we can, you know, have a chance to get back to you because um, it may run, you know, beyond the, the hour slotted here as well. No, well, I think we're almost done. Uh, I mean, on, on my Excellent. side of things. Yeah, so this is a YAML file I've prepared, YAML manifest I've prepared out of time. And what it does is it just creates like a, a deployment with three Nginx uh, servers, basically. Uh, it groups them in a service, community service. And then we also create like a, a second deployment with three web clients using like a, um, a, a Docker image I've, I've prepared out of time. And what that web client is going to do is it's going to loop. And every, every second, it's going to start like uh, a connection to the engine service that's going to last for 30 seconds. So after 30 seconds, we're going to kill that connection. But we're going to keep uh, creating a new connection every second. And what's going to happen for those connections is they're basically going to be in the TCP established state for 30 seconds, because that's how long we keep the connection open. Uh, but then after that, they're going to be uh, in the time wait state for an extra two minutes, 120 seconds, which is a default on, on Linux. So basically, each connection that we create like this is going to stay in the connection tra uh, tracking table for 30 seconds plus 120 seconds. So the, the lifetime of a connection in that tracking table is going to be 150 seconds. Uh, so we can expect that each client is going to be, uh, is going to account for 150 uh, TCP connection once we reach like that kind of like steady state. Um, so let me apply that YAML here with kubectl and let's look at the pods again. Uh, here we go. So we see our six pods, uh, three clients and three servers are, are uh, creating right now. And uh, because I have a single worker node in my cluster, uh, and I didn't untake the master uh, to to accept like uh, workload pods. All those six pods are actually going to be scheduled on the same uh, worker node, but that's not an issue for for the sake of this demo. Okay, all the pods are running, so that means I must have started to 
uh, create connections. So let's go back to Grafana. Oh, okay. So uh, in the last few seconds, we jumped from zero and four connections to, it's hard to say, uh, right now we're at 117 and 142 and still climbing, right? Because every second I have like three connections that I'm creating. Um, and that's also going to show, by the way, the, uh, the UDP connections that are used to resolve the service by uh, contacting uh, the core DNS service, right? So what we have here is the UDP connections between the web clients and, uh, and the core DNS service, plus the TCP connections between the web clients and the uh, engine service. So uh, that number is basically going to keep like uh, increasing until we reach like a, uh, I think it's like uh, something like 900 or something like this. Okay, so we're oh, this is this is great. So now, so now I've got direct feedback for either my platform operators or an SRE team um, that can actually look at my my connections and and, and begin to diagnose, uh, you know, why we're why we were having those issues. Maybe we need to you know reconfigure um, the size of our connection tracking table or something like that. Yeah, obviously this is a synthetic workload here, but uh, uh, having this in entry and your production cluster would enable you to visualize how your number of connections evolve over time and kind of like provision your connection tracking table like accordingly. Excellent. Well, yeah, so I'm gonna throw up our, uh, our, our, our slide that shows um, everyone where they can go to find out more information again. And again, I wanted to uh, thank everyone for um, you know, connecting and, 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 and sharing some, some time with us as we showed you Antria. Um, if you haven't uh, tried it, we encourage you to download it. Um, it's very easy to install. All the documentation is either at our website at antria.io. You, uh, you can view the documentation HTML or you can view it directly on the GitHub repo in our uh, docs directory with all the markdowns. We've got a lot of great instructions um, on standing up your own clusters, installing uh, the CNI, and hopefully after today, um, you've seen you know just how easy it is to dive in and actually uh, start contributing um, features uh, you know to the project and helping us improve it for everyone. So with that, we're at the top of the hour. Again, if you have any additional questions, uh, we would encourage you to uh, move those over to the Antria Slack channel. And uh, thank you again for attending. Thank everyone you. have a great day.